So we're going to get right to it and, and waste no time. Not that any time talking to our good friends from Bloom or from the mayor's office would ever be a waste of time. So we're going to start with the uh, Bloom Rock Coalition. And we would love to get an update from you on how things are going with the rollout of cannabis in Rochester and your collaborative efforts to get our community involved in this new and emerging industry. Thank you so much. As always, it's an honor to always come and share the work that we're doing for Bloom Rock. Um, I actually think that in order to do this work, you need to stay close to the community because it's hard. <laughs> and I think journalism is real. If you're watching the news, it's noisy. And it feels like change is not happening in New York. Um, we were in Boston last week and we found out that the first black dispensary took 10 years. Hmm. But currently in New York, one in four of our dispensaries are owned by black and brown communities. And 30 that makes up 30 of them are actually by black businesses. So I say that with pride that even though it seems very hard and it's difficult, I'm happy to be a part of this change. Um, when I last was here, I shared that I am a professor at Genesee Community College, teaching the first non-plant touching um, cannabis class. And that was through a state funded grant. The class allowed for 10 seats. Seven of the 10 seats were um, citizen, I mean residents of Rochester, New York, and four of them actually participated through Bloom. So it just reminds us that the work we do is not just one time we're touching you, we're making sure we're continuing to bring opportunities your way. So thank you. I'm going to pass it over to my team. Uh, good evening, uh, City Council, esteemed guests. Uh, we'd like to thank you once again for allowing us to be here. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Medford. I am the Director of Community Engagement, and I'd like to share with you some of the things that we've done here within our community. We've supported 140 potential C applicants with small groups and one-on-one -on -one technical assistance programming. We've supported 25 applicants representing the Finger Lakes and Western region over four licensing types by the deadline. We've partnered with eight strategic partners, 31 hours supporting C applicants through ongoing business development one-on-one. -on -one. We've hosted three town halls designed to inform residents of industry updates locally, regionally, and throughout the state. Four non-provisional applicants deficiencies were cured, were cured. We've spent 75 hours directly engaging Rochester's east, west, north side communities disproportionately impacted, touching over 50 streets, engaging over 315 residents. We have devoted 78,864 hours over 160, 186 days. Just to give, um, thank you all for having us here, um, to give an update for our first fundraising uh, event we had in February, our Boom Rock Gala, uh, was more than just a, it transcended a mere gathering. Uh, it was a networking event and also a display of um, recognition for the 25 applicants that we did submit applications for as well honoring um, prominent members of our community with um, Majority Leader Crystal People Stokes, Senator Jeremy Cooney, and our own um, City Councilman Michael Patterson, amongst others. And um, we also want to acknowledge uh, our work, work with um, the City of Rochester, with the City Council, uh, Mayor Evans, Sadie McAllister, uh, Sadie McAllen, and um, former Mayor Lovely Warren. Hi, I'm Precious Brown, the uh, co-founder for Bloom Rock, and the um, executive director, co-executive director for Strategic Partnership. Um, I want to talk about what's next for Bloom Rock. So we are currently awaiting our non-for-profit status, um, and also in the midst of planning our next fund run, our next fundraiser to support Bloom Rock's mission and to also push the vision. We are in the midst of implementing our professional development through our ELEs, which is our educational learning experiences. That's going to be geared for the general public. And then also we want to support the first business incubator for license holders to really support sustainability in the cannabis market. And then lastly, uh, we want to continue to foster relationships with partners that support the cannabis ecosystem from the city, county, and region perspective. 
And then I really want to share that, you know, we've been supporting, um, we've, we've ultimately been supporting these applicants as they've been going through this process. And we are proud to state that, you know, at this point we have two applications um, that could be potentially coming down the pipeline to secure licensure within the city of Rochester, considering the fact that as of today, we do not have a dispensary um, open up within the city limits. So we're extremely excited about that um, to state that, you know, through the efforts of Bloom over the next, um, we're thinking within the next 30 to 60 days, we could possibly have a, a licensed dispensary opened up. So thank you. So I'm going to turn it over to council members. We're going to start at the end and just come down the line. Um, and so council member Gruber. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. All the, all the hard work you all do every day. Uh, it's much appreciated. I, the, um, the idea of how much noise there is, is, is certainly not lost on me. There was just a, another batch of headlines that sounded like bad news statewide. Can you zoom us out to the, to the state level? What seems to be happening now? What are the what are the state mechanisms that need to be pulled for us to be able to see more dispensaries um, and and businesses across the spectrum locally? Um, I think two two folds um, are in place right now. I think one it also requires us to just be informed and continue to get the information out to our community. I just told you it took ten years for one business to open in a, a community recognizing that what we need from us is to be prepared. I think I'm scared because if we're just the ones that are doing the work, when you say, what can we do as a city, help us to help the residents to prepare in a way that we're not getting lost because the state is doing what they can. They're navigating that. I think the second round, and I can attest through the people we're directly helping, out of the 25, we currently can account for 14 of them on the list. And as I'm looking through the list, they calling me and they watching it and they excited and they have their, that's not where we were when we did the card application. You did not see communities of color being represented, even the thought of it or even knowing what can happen. So I think, how do we stay informed? That's the ELEs and the town halls that we're having to just let you know about the industry. Cause it is noisy and social media can be somewhat of a distraction to real issues that we have to do. And I think second, preparing our communities by supporting businesses like our own to support the residents. And then lastly, I wanna add that we want to just remain steadfast and unfazed um, to really make sure that we are you know, not divided and um, having a good understanding of how to create a compliant business that happens to be selling cannabis. Um, thank you for all the good work that you have been doing and uh, um, the dedication. I'm very inspired and in awe about it, um, especially since this is like transformational for those who, you know, see cannabis in a different light. My question um, is more along the lines of just trying to figure out, are you guys able to help out um, people of color um, who may have interest in becoming a grower of cannabis, you know, a licensed grower? Do you guys have a space that you've been able to assist with that or is that something that's you know on your radar for later um, I can speak that so we 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 help all licensing types so from cultivators to processors micro business uh, dispensary so anybody who's looking to get into the cannabis industry whether they want to get into a delivery license that's soon to come out a, 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 a nursery license that's soon to come out we're, we're able to assist them in all different facets so anybody who's looking to get in the cannabis industry can actually work with us in that way thank you people of color it's so, uh, social economic equity act can I just have a follow-up question to that? So, um, so when you said that you were working with all, is there any um, black businesses that are seeking any of those other licensures besides just dispensary? Yes. Um, I would say it's a breakdown of where the license of the 25, if you look at the graph. Yeah. So 21 are micro businesses and retail, one cultivator, one processor, and then two of the applications were invalid because they like the timeline them to pay it didn't like coincide. Th thank yeah. you no problem all right well first and foremost I just want to pause and say thank you I mean this has been tremendous work that we've been able to see from the onset when you started doing this work when you started coming to speak you know to us at council um, 
and I, I, I just can't begin to thank you enough because I know that in absence of you doing this, there's many in Rochester that would be left behind. So I want to start there and also acknowledge that, you know, the nonprofit component of this is, I think, an important mechanism. Um, and it's certainly something that you should keep council abreast of. Um, you know, once you have nonprofit status so that we can have conversations about how we might be able to support the overall effort. My question, though, um, is around, and, and you may not have this, <clears throat> you may not have this information yet, but I just want to get a sense. Um, so when, when the state decided to go in this direction, there was a, a clear indication that they wanted to fund and, and they wanted to support black and brown businesses and particularly in communities that were impacted the most. And so in the population that you're working with to get the licenses, the various types of licenses, um, could you give us a sense, of, if you don't have it all today, but maybe even a follow-up in writing or something, of where are these businesses potentially located, where are their interest in locating, where are the, the, the constituents from, right? So people who are interested in opening a real t retail spot, obviously they gotta work through logistics and find a location, but just to get us a sense, is it, you know, X number in 14621, X number in 14611, something like that, so we have a sense of what's in the pipeline potentially, what's the interest level, and for me, it's also about the equity that we're trying to all achieve here with this market, and it will be important for me to just understand the demographics a little bit more. So if you could speak to that maybe a little bit today, but I would love to follow up on that some more. That's a great question, and so currently the Office of Cannabis Management has provided technical assistance uh, providers with a tool, it's called the Proximity Tool, and right now the City of Rochester has 26 pending license, um, correct me if I'm wrong, you guys, 26? 26. 26, and then currently three active license, meaning uh, dispensaries that would be able to open. And so if, uh, from what we're hearing, we should have a dispensary open, soft open this Saturday. Well, great. And then in terms of the market saturation in a city our size, is there a tipping point that the state is looking at, you know, X number of dispensaries, X number of retail businesses, or is it open-ended? Is it kind of free market open-ended? To Brandy's point, uh, we have focused, myself and Jeff, we have focused our efforts uh, for cannabis canvassing for Processor 3 to really let the residents of Rochester know that that is um, a opportunity. Great. This is um, definitely a low cost way for people to get into the market. If you qualify for social economic equity, it's 50% off of everything. So the application fee will be $500 and the actual license will be $1,000. That's much more easy for people to get into 
and they're actually going to have a brand, a safe cannabis product that's ran through a process, three tested perfectly, and put on the shelves. The only way to have a product on the shelf in New York State is to have a license, and that license opens the door for a lot of people to have a, a chance to be in the market. And so that we're very clear, we're talking about, you know, the individuals that are currently making your gummies, your cookies, your lemonades. Those are the individuals that we're referencing that has an opportunity for processor three license. And, and one of the reasons we pushed that license was we trying to get as much information to as possible. Because these particular licenses are not out of the scope of what they are currently doing right this moment. So it's not a far reach. It's right in, within the uh, confines of what they're doing right now. Well, amazing work, and thank you again for your update today. Thank you. Just wow. I remember that folks spent years running through the halls of Albany fighting for this, and I'm sure that the National Drug Policy Alliance, as well as the majority leader, Crystal People Stokes, are ecstatic. You guys are making history. So thank you for all that you do. And you have answered already a few of the questions. So, but a question about the processor three license. So does that come with resources or with the promise of resources because you guys have a plan on how folks can get the resources to start a dispensary? All good questions. Um, so it, it does not come with resources. It comes with us opening up our network to resources. So uh, giving um, the applicant or license holder information on the local processors in the area because we have local processors. Um, giving the applicant information on you know um, the lab you know, local labs that are in the area, such as Certainty Analytics, ran by Dr. Brandy Young, um, right here on East Main. So really opening up our network, our sphere of influence, and um, our strategic partners, and really making sure that um, if we are bringing a cohort through our incubator, that they have access to all resources in that way. Right. Can you speak to those strategic partners, just to name a few? Sorry, so sorry. Um, yes, we currently do have uh, strategic partners. Um, as she shares Certainty Analytics, we're currently working with three uh, processor ones who are currently uh, on in the queue under 200, so definitely looking likely for them. Uh, our board members, which will be released soon, our community license holders within the community that are willing to leverage their resources in the community, um, we have thought through the barriers and the plans that we can foresee for our community and put that into the incubator to ensure that they have access. Um, I think a lot of the conversation um, also working with CWI um, was about how do we make sure they understand the whole cycle of the plant? Because it's not just, I think it's a lot of learning and I think that right now, fortunately and unfortunately, you're not finding a lot of access to education um, so we're providing and standing in the gap. Um, everyone will be taking a survey, and it tells us uh, executive coaching so that they will have access to the skill sets that they need. It might be tech. Maybe they don't know how to use a PowerPoint, and that's not, they've been growing cannabis for 20 years, and they don't know how to do that. But they're growing the next strength. Right now, if you go to the Grower Cups, all of the cannabis that is in the top 10 is coming out of our region. Yep. They are fire. Like, I'm like, what? I say that in a way of if that is what the young industry is talking about and young people are now reactivating in their own knowledge, it is our job to be the resource to bring this back home. We just need a little help. So that's where we at. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Can I just two quick questions? Can we get a cheat sheet around the processors and the license? What, yes. what level one, two, and three mean? Mm -hmm. So, so New York State has one pagers on all the different license types, and we can get those copies over to you guys, so that way you can review each license type, the costs with it, the canopy sizes, all, all the everything's inside the one pager. That would, you that would be great because I'm assuming this is not going to be the last work session. So, to have that information in front of us, we'll be able to follow along a little bit better. And so my next question is regarding communities. So can you name some of the characteristics of how you are defining communities 
disproportionately impacted. Who are they? Um, so that was done actually for us by New York State. There's there's a um, map that you can go to on, online and put in the address, and it tells you over what is the span of the last 1980 to now tells you to, to, to 2021 tells you what communities were um, disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs, and that's based on the, the arrest records and, and things like that in the community. So it's right on New York State website. And we have 80. We have 80. Yeah, 80 CDIs. And so we can ensure that those that those tools and those resources, along with the proximity tool, that will outline um, the 26 uh, potential or the 26 pending applications and in which district they're located in. Um, so we can send that resource over as well. Right, but just maybe one or two characteristics, like you mentioned, the war on drugs and the over arrest. I mean, that, that was the major one because um, as it, what, it was 30, how many much in lost wages? So we know it's 33 billion in lost wages, but to directly impact, I think about, I would love to see an overlapping map between education. So just take the schools that are failing, look at it, type in a CDI neighborhood, and I'm 80% certain the schools will come up because I can't, I went to number four school, my, that's in a district that was there. If you look, I lived in Van Acker, everywhere over there is in the district. So when we talk about the arrest rates, we know that already in Rochester, one in three black men would be the ones that will be arrested for the actual war on drugs. So when we talk about the harm, the harm is in our schools because it did trickle down when y'all took the parents away from their homes and their dads were incarcerated. I had a great dad. I don't come from a family. I know people think if your family is in cannabis, you were unloved. That is not true. <laughs> that is not true. So if you look at the address, pull up anybody that votes for you. Type in the address in your district. And I'm pretty sure if y'all look at your own districts, you will be astonished to see what it actually means when we talk about the schools, when we talk about dilapidated houses, when we talk about all of that. So I just. I could listen to you all day because I think that you're onto something and I hope that as you guys grow in the work, just going to be paying attention to see some of these solutions maybe that you may even have regarding how we move ourselves out of poverty and the impact that that war on drugs has had on poverty. So just thank you all for everything that you are doing. Amazing. Do any other council members have any other questions? Okay, so folks, we have chewed up half an hour and I feel like we've only been here five minutes. And we could probably go another hour, but we are not. So I'm going to thank y'all for coming in today. And, and it is, we're going to look at seeing if we can reschedule you guys pretty much every other month to come back in. But I'm also going to work with our, our council staff to see if we can get together with you and do a more comprehensive education piece here in council chambers that's open to the community. Because you have so much information to share and it's, it's like just from talking to you, there are things I wanna to talk to you about, but that's another hour and I'm not gonna do that. I just can't, like I'm like, well, you know, cause part of me is like, well, I want you to, to, to clarify what a C application is. And I'm like, no, 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 we're not gonna do that. And, but I, I wanna say this before we let you go. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand the resource that we have here. This is, you don't get much more than community led than the Bloom Rock Coalition. This is our community, educating and hitting the ground and knocking on the doors and talking to folks who are legacy market folks. And for you folks who don't know what legacy market means, it's real simple. The folks that sell weed now, that make marijuana products now, the folks that the police chase now, <laughs> we're working on getting those folks to make the transition from the legacy market to the legal market. And this Bloom Coalition is sitting in that nexus, in that space going, wait, 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 you already know how to do this. Come get a license and just keep doing what you're doing. So when they're talking about that C processor license, what you're saying is the folks that are already making gummies now, you already have a brand, people know your product. Baby, you ain't gotta do nothing but get a license get a connect somebody to give you some clean supply, you make what you make, you send it over, you get it tested, 
and then it goes into a dispensary. That's your business. You mean that thing you already do? That thing you already do. We're not trying to get you to do anything other than what you already do. We're just trying to make you legal while you do it. That's the fundamental point of what you guys are making today. Is that correct? Okay. And now I'm going to stop. So we, we, we got to go on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's why I let everybody go first because we got to go on. Can you just make sure when you do the education session, it's it longer be, than an hour? It will, it will be. maybe a series. It will be at night. Okay. We are, we are going to do a thing. So. All right. So with that work being done, man, that's just is not enough time. So now we go over to the mayor's office and we are looking for updates. Um, so it, the committee is the Neighborhood Jobs and Housing Committee. And because it is a Neighborhood Jobs and Housing Committee, homelessness follows under this committee. Because if you're homeless, you don't have a house. And we are working on getting those, addressing those folks and getting them resources and help. So at this time, I turn it over to the staff from the mayor's office. And feel free to introduce yourself, and we, we await your presentation. Great. Well, thanks, Councilmember Patterson. Grateful for the opportunity to provide an update uh, on the topic of homelessness. Uh, we'll keep it high level in terms of just what's been happening over the past three months, and certainly mindful of time. If there are questions that we can't get to or, or deeper policy discussions, happy to do work sessions, follow up with questions and writing, whatever is most useful to uh, the council, but I'd like to introduce uh, here today to present for us is Sadie McCallan, uh, our manager of emerging initiatives, and she is joined by uh, Captain Gabriel Person from RPD, uh, who works uh, and leads our uh, homeless outreach effort. So, Sadie, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, also, thank you for allowing me to speak on the subject matter, um, Council President Melendez and Chair uh, Patterson. Um, essentially, the city. Um, offers a myriad of collaborative services um, with um, other uh, community agencies. Um, we're a part of an evolving and growing um, network that's raising awareness about homelessness, particularly in the mayor's office. Um, I'm currently developing and working to um, develop strategies to help the homeless in the city of Rochester, create a strategic plan to merge with existing and continuous efforts, um, and to continue to navigate internally and externally uh, with our community partners. Um, and I've also begun coordinating efforts with NBD. While considering that I am relatively new to the Rochester area, a big portion of this is getting out into the community and understanding and learning about the things that are going on. So it's not just saying what we're doing. Like I've literally had the opportunity to go out with the RPD to do our point in time count. I have been able to go out to the different um, NSC centers and do tours so that I'm able to see and really speak to the locations um, that are brought up weekly um, and are outreach efforts or if someone is asking or having a question that I have some knowledge and awareness of the areas and the people that we're speaking to. But um, continuing on, some of the services that are offered uh, through the R Rochester Police Department um, include providing a coordination of outreach efforts with the community partners um, at specific locations, identifying individuals that feel unsafe and are struggling obtaining sh shelter due to those um, obstacles, um, deploying outreach team members to follow up on some of the data that has been received through our community partners and partnering with um, those organizations to have service focused events um, such as our homeless luncheon and to date I believe that they have had four since 2022 and then also, um, we have an ongoing effort through the DRIES department where they are currently um, implementing a homeless outreach pilot project. It started in March of this year and it is scheduled to conclude in June of 24. Um, within the initial month of their outreach, they had already made 50 contacts, um, but they are partnering with the Goodwill to give out winter essentials. Um, and coats to individuals that are in need. And then um, they also provide victim assistance for individuals that need help finding temporary safe housing and food and clothing to fa families, legal assistance and counseling. In the next months that we see coming, we would like to, con or I would like to help 
all of these entities continue to collaboratively work together to develop local system plans to prevent um, and address the issue of homelessness, continue to improve our effective homeless response systems, and then continue to build that network that I mentioned earlier that's evolving and growing um, to address the issue of homelessness. Try to keep it kind of tight there for you. Council members, if we have qu questions, we'll start here at the end with council member. Okay, we'll start here and we'll just come down the line. So. All right, Councilmember Smith. Cut me off if I'm asking too many. This no, this no. is a issue that is near and dear to me. So first, um, welcome to Rochester, and thank you. So the strategic plan. Where are you with writing that? Is it complete, or what is the timeline, and will it be shared with council? Um, I actually. I've sat in several meetings um, where the mayor attended and we had some discussions with um, other external organizations about um, future outreach efforts and kind of deciding what our focal point, where we'd like to start because there are so many components of homelessness. You have your veterans, you have your youth, you have um, just deciding where to kind of segue in um, and also making sure that we're not duplicating a lot of efforts that are going through the county. Um, so I am still in the introductory process. Um, I am looking to have some regularly scheduled um, meetings that will occur with the county as well. And then that will allow um, to take into consideration what we're building out and how long that timeline looks. But again, it, it, it's, a, it's a process right now. Um, so while I sit on um, the Homeless Service Network Steering Committee and things like that, I'm, I'm becoming privy to a lot of additional information that will be factored in, um, but I'm, I'm actively engaged in the writing of this um, information, you know, it just getting those additional resources added to make sure that it's a fully encompassed document. And How just are to you? follow up on that, uh, if I may, I think council member or chair Patterson you know feels like we're doing these updates every other month whether it be on homelessness and cannabis so council member Smith to your question we'll continue to keep you apprised on on progress related to that plan and certainly uh, you know consider what is the best way to, to share Great. that information with council can you tell me how you are prioritizing are there areas within that strategic plan that you are prioritizing are you focusing on chronic homeless or what do you, how are you prioritizing so I think it's pretty early stage but I think certainly a chronic homelessness uh, is a, a primary area of focus you know we really want to see homelessness get to a point where it is uh, rare brief and non-recurring mm -hmm. uh, and so certainly you know unfortunately many of the homeless in our community are are known to those who provide uh, homeless services so it's really you know we want to we want to focus on that chronic piece uh, and and really make sure that the work that we're doing collaborating with others in the community whether it be the county uh, other homeless services providers and housing providers uh, that that that's an area where we can make a uh, significant impact All right so how are you actively in engaging with those who are living in encampments. So I think engagement happens regularly through Captain Persons uh, Homeless Outreach, and I'll let him uh, describe a little bit about that, but that weekly effort, uh, I think certainly as we develop our plan, considering getting feedback from those who are homeless and getting that perspective will be an integral part of the information gathering. Yes. So uh, yeah, before you respond, can you just incorporate in that response why police are involved? Yes, absolutely. Firstly, uh, I want to thank the uh, all the council members for uh, again allowing us to present. Uh, I guess I'll take your question going backwards. So the, I think the most important thing uh, to understand when it comes to the chronic homeless and those that were dealing with is sometimes it's uh, cannot be a safe environment for them to operate in meaning the outreach workers so we when we were uh, you know looking to get involved seeing that the chronic uh, uh, homeless problem that we have in Rochester is here and has not gone away right it's only expanded um, so 
the officers are involved, myself, uh, the, all the officers from the community relations unit uh, are involved for the safety of the outreach workers. So uh, when we're doing our outreaches on Thursday, we, uh, you know, we are not looking to uh, change what the outreach workers are doing as far as outreach, uh, but we are there for safety. I just worry about re-stimulating or triggering folks. And so you're there for the safety of the worker, but not for the well-being of the actual person. So I would say that we're there for both because, uh, again, I think the community relations unit officers are uniquely suited, uh, as we are in the community, for other reasons as well. Um, so we do recognize that our presence can be uh, something that may be triggering and we do take steps to try and mitigate that um, but again the outreach workers can't do their work to uh, reduce homelessness if they're concerned about their safety so mm -hmm. so outside of the chronic homeless I'm thinking about those who are actively seeking shelter but with mental health and substance use issues and for those two populations, we do not have a housing first model. And so how are we handling those folks? Can, can I just, yeah, let me jump in here. Um, I know you guys are talking about homelessness. I, I wanna say a lot of what we do at the city is in collaboration, connection. Um, I wanna be clear, we are not home, the, the homeless service providers. Mostly everything we do is predicated on Monroe County and our role is really to coordinate with existing partners that are on the ground and with Monroe County. So when we talk about housing force model and all those things, it really is a advocacy component. Um, so Ms. McCallum, her job, her portfolio is cannabis, it's homelessness, but, but it's important that we be um, partners in this. So although we are not the leaders in homelessness, I think a lot of um, the issues that relate to homelessness, they land in our city. So this is why we had to stick our nose in this to get involved uh, with this. But I think um, to your point, council member, um, that, that, that housing first model, which I'm a big proponent of as well, is something that we have to continue to work with our partners in the county, the county to say, this is why the housing first model is important because we're seeing this on Clinton Avenue. We're seeing this on Jefferson Avenue. We're seeing this in our areas of the city. So how can we as a city push to support that model with, with the limited resources that we have by relying on those partners um, and, and those folks, particularly at the county, to make sure that we see that housing force model that we know is critical in order to, to solve a lot of the other issues that are residual that are a result from, from homes. Well, it's good to know that that's actively being done. So when we have the update, as you mentioned, every other month, can we talk about the progress that is being made in that area? Yeah, I think that that's, yeah, we absolutely should. And I think not only just us, but as a community writ large, um, we should be talking about the progress that we're making towards making sure that we're, we're seeing people housed. Because that has to be the, that has to be the ultimate measure. Um, if we are doing any of these efforts, and there's a lot of, there's, a, there's money being spent. I always say there should be more money being spent. Um, there's a lot of money being spent in this area. So it's important that we um, magnify and measure the results that we are getting from these efforts. Um, and, and, and for us, we um, have to rely on a lot of the kindness of other entities because unfortunately we don't control it and we don't get the resources that come along with it. But we hope that we can use our position as a city that is, that, that is experiencing the effects of homelessness to get people to, 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 move, to, to move in that direction. So um, we're hoping that we will be able to um, report regularly on the progress that we're seeing, but more importantly that we're able to actually see progress and, and, and have results as a, as, as a result of now having, we've never had, if you'd have told me three years ago that we would need a dedicated person in City Hall to deal with this, I would have said, we, that's not our issue, that's a, that's a county thing, but, it, but it's, it's an impact in our community in such a major way that I felt, and I, and I know this, everyone in this room probably feels, that we have to be in the game and be involved. And, it, and it has to be through this coordination, collaboration, and pushing um, what we would like to see in this area. And what we can do, there's things that we can do. Um, and to the best of, of our ability, we want to be able to do those things. Great. And at some point, I, I think I, I would be hopeful in seeing the strategic plan and the deliverables around 
the Emerging Communities Program. Yeah. All right. Council President? Yes, thank you, Chief Madison. So um, most of my questions were answered already, but I do have a follow-up related to the Monroe County collaboration, because I know that historically the county is uh, ultimately responsible or has been deemed responsible for addressing a lot of the concerns around homelessness, um, but it does land in our lap, right, in, as a city. So um, can, can someone speak to the collaboration that's happening, not just internally between city departments and the nonprofits, but with Monroe County itself, and if there is ultimately going to be a joint plan that we, that we would feed into? Yeah, I think I think our relationship with the county obviously has been the strongest it's been, and I think that they have been um, very supportive of, of of our efforts in terms of going out, going places where they can uh, be of assistance. And I think that that um, collaboration will be will continue. We, we, you cannot address or even talk about homelessness without having Monroe County in the conversation, and that's part of Sadie's job. Uh, as uh, Ms. McCallum's job as part of emergency initiative, emerging initiatives, um, as well as other departments within the city to collaborate with the county. So all of all of this is, do, ha, ha, is done in collaboration with the county. Not only the work that, and I'm just walking in, um, that, that is happening, that is being coordinated um, from Ms. McAllen, but also the Department of Recreation and, and, and Human Services. So her job, I want to be clear, is to um, help connect the dots and collaborate with entities like Monroe County, like other departments in the city, uh, as well as other community-based organizations to address this, this this chronic issue. Yeah, Mayor, and I think that's that's kind of my, my point, too, is at some point it would be helpful to understand where our line is in terms of this issue and how far we go versus where is it someone else's responsibility, too. I think ultimately we all feel responsible for our constituents in our city, but just understanding the resources and where our resources end and where the counties picks up would be helpful. So seeing that at yeah. some point, I know that's the work yeah. um, would be helpful to the council. But, so that, but, that's but, all I have. But that is a very, very good point, Mr. President, because as you know, many people still think that the city of Rochester, and I'm going through the budget process before I present the budget to you guys, uh, to you all, and as you know, many people think that the city of Rochester has this endless pot of money, but there are other entities, including the school district, county, state, that have much larger dollars than us. So we have to be very careful, to your point, in terms of where our responsibility ends and where others uh, pick up, because it's a resource issue. And, and, if, and we, we don't ha if we don't have those resources, we don't want to set, set it up to make it seem that we're going to be addressing things that are not within our wheelhouse because it's going to create um, issues long term, particularly from a fiscal standpoint. Council Vice President. Thank you, uh, Chair Patterson. Um, I just like to add my comments to the fact that, yes, I agree with you, Mayor Evans and um, President Melendez um, and my other council colleagues that I've seen uh, the city move more and more into other wheelhouses trying to help, and that was because of the impact of COVID-19. Uh, it was like a matter of all hands on deck, but now we have to really look at drawing that line, as you mentioned, just making sure that people know that we have limited resources and we have to kind of get back a little bit more to as, as much as possible within reason to status quo and try to make sure that we sub use sustainable um, resources to the things that we need to make sure that we stay on top of. Um, of course, leveraging all of our county resources and state and federal resources to help making sure that we address the homelessness. And I mean, just some examples. I mean, and, and council might want a work session on this. We now, on a pilot basis, provide mental health services in our libraries. We now, on a pilot basis, provide mental health services in um, a, a, a large subset of our R centers. We've expanded PIC um, uh, to, uh, to in, in a major way, moved almost from a part-time model to almost uh, strictly full-time model. These are all things that four years ago, five years ago, we did not do as a city. So. Um, to the president and vice president point, the, 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 we have to keep that in mind because if we are going to then take on those issues, we have to reevaluate and ask and get the resources that that need to come with that. Because right now we're doing a lot of those things without dollars from places that that do those things. So th that model is so important if we if we want to be able to sustain it, and we know that it's important. Um, so th that that's a th those are very very important points, and I'm glad. Um, that that's been put out there. 
Um, and I'd just like to um, follow up, and I'm, I'm not sure if this is a part of your strategic plan, but I just also to point out the fact that we do have um, homeowners that face foreclosure. I just got a phone call yesterday from a homeowner that's facing foreclosure and was reaching out for resources. So um, what can you explain what kind of network do you have to assist our residents for foreclosure? I think from our perspective, it's um, working with the, a lot of the community-based organizations that uh, do the foreclosure prevention. You know that um, Right to Counsel is something that we um, sponsored before with eviction prevention um, stuff. We spend a lot of time on COVID, and we actually spent ARPA dollars on that. Um, but I think that this is why this, this collaboration is so important, because there are so many organizations, such as the Housing Council and others, that work on this foreclosure prevention, um, these foreclosure prevention efforts that we can connect people with that uh, many in the community don't, are not aware of these organizations, but there are some great organizations in Rochester that work with um, foreclosure prevention as well as the um, eviction, uh, eviction prevention as well. Thank you. Council Member Gruber. Yeah, I'll be very brief just with two comments. Um, I, I agree, <clears throat> Mayor and everyone in your administration about the relationship with the county, but I also s would argue that we need to be thoughtful about the relationship with the nonprofit sector when it comes to homeless services. And I, without trying to uh, disparage or demean any anyone out there, I think we need more out of our continuum of care. I think if we look at what was written about in Houston in the last couple of months, where everyone has kind of said that Houston is doing the best at tackling homelessness of any city in the country, part of it is because their continuum of care, their consortium of nonprofit homeless service providers has taken a leadership role that I just don't think we have here. And I'm hopeful that part of the strategic plan can be pushing on that a little bit as well, and the city and the county pushing on what we expect out of our nonprofit sector in this space. And the second part of that, which is related, is that I know the, you know the city can't do everything when it comes to programming, but the city can do a lot when it comes to building. And we have a bunch of the ARPA dollars that are available to us right now that I understand there was an RFP, and there's still an opportunity to spend some money on some of the transitional housing. And we need to make sure that whatever decisions we make with these millions of dollars, that hopefully we can build uh, uh, beds and create connectivity with the nonprofit and uh, sector and with the county so that our part can be less about programming and these ongoing expenses and more about the upfront capital costs, which we actually have federal dollars to spend on now. But we got to make some decisions that have to be informed by these other entities as well. I think, I think that's a great point because that, that's where we really can have the biggest bang for the buck in terms of what we can bring to the table. The partners bring what they bring, the county has what they bring, but we can bring the building, right? Because we have the space and we have the opportunity to be able to do that. The, other, the second point I'll make is, you know, the op opioid settlement dollars that, we, that we're using, and you know we are, um, we'll be bringing the council in May, the two other ambassador programs for, the, the, the two, for Monroe Avenue and Lau Avenue, but right now currently we have Clinton and Jefferson Avenue the the good thing about that and this could be a model that maybe can be used to homelessness and this is a longer conversation for us to have is there are some very specific deliverables that we that we are asking these people to have how many people did you go on the street and reach how many of those folks now are jobs are, are, are got put into jobs how many of them now are um, going to be put into housing if they're not if, if they're not in housing anymore um, what's the what's the relationship with um, the the, the um, homeowners and businesses around those around those neighborhoods. Have you had community conversations with them? So those are all things that we're putting in the neighborhood ambassador program things that have to be measured because the opioid dollars demand that you have to have those type of measurements. It would be great if, as a community, we could have some of those exact same deliverables when we're when we're talking about homelessness um, to see if um, partners that we're working with are delivering on those uh, on those type of deliverables. And there is some some um, cross pollination. Um, there, because some of the folks who will be working on the um, on the on the neighborhood ambassador stuff also work in the space of of of, of homelessness. So um, th that might be an opportunity for us to see um, the effect that uh, organizations that are that are contracting with the city or county or whoever or the state or whoever they're contracting with are are, are having that type of impact. Okay. Um, on that note, we're going to take a five-minute break because I've had council members sitting here for. 50 minutes straight, um, then we're going to come take five minutes, we'll do what you got to do, whatever that is, and come on back and we'll get to the legislation.
thank you. <laughs> I figured with this, your face would do that as soon as I said yes, that. Okay. Yes, okay. So now that it's done, I feel yes. a lot about it. Oh, hopefully all good. Your name yeah. will see you. Yes, <laughs> it has to be. Good. Awesome. Yeah, I, uh, I definitely look forward to working in your heart. I, I definitely think you guys had uh, some good points on the, uh, the city's own some, but the county owns a lot. And I thought that I really, my job, I think, is to facilitate the collaboration. Like, I don't want to be in the way of people because these are our service provider, but I feel like we can help bridge the service. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be starting up in two minutes. Appreciate you, brother. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Please take your seats. Okay, and so we begin.
Introductory number 88, authorizing the sale of real estate. Questions, comments, or concerns? Oh, before we get going, um, before we get under that one, um, President Melendez is required to recuse from deliberations and from the vote on introductory number 88, um, sale of real estate. So, any other council members? Do we have any questions, comments, or concerns? Move it. Moved it? Second. Moved and seconded, and now we vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Abstain. And one abstain. Introductory passes. Introductory number 89, authorizing, sorry, introductory number 89, authorizing a license agreement for a fiber conduit in the subterranean, subterranean truck tunnel beneath 20 South Clinton Avenue. Questions, comments, or concerns? Seeing none, I need Move a and second. Second. Moved and seconded. And now we vote. All in favor of introductory number 89, please say aye. 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 Introductory passes. Introductory number 90. We have a disclosure of interest form from Council Member Gruber. He was required to recuse from deliberations and from the vote. Any other questions, comments, or concerns regarding introductory number 90, authorizing the sale of real estate to Foodlink Farms, LLC? Second. Moved and seconded. And now we vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Introductory passes. Abstention. And one abstention. Thank you, sir. Introductory number 91, local improvement ordinance reestablishing the East Avenue Alexander Street Entertainment District and setting the assessment for the assessment for special services for the 2024-25 assessment period. Public hearing to be held on Thursday, April 18th at 6 p.m. Questions, comments, or concerns? Move it. Second. Moved and seconded, and now we vote. All in favor of introductory number 91, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say nay. Introductory passes. Introductory number 92, we have a disclosure of interest form from President Melendez. He is required to recuse from deliberations and from the vote. Introductory number 92 is authorizing the mandatory agreement related to the Buy the Block project. Do we have any questions, comments, or concerns? I Council have one. I got comments. We'll take them in order, Vice President, and then Council Member Smith. Uh, thank you, Chair Patterson. I'm just um, excited about, and I'll just put out here, introductory number 92 and 93. By the Brock is coming to the west side, <laughs> to the southwest side. <laughs> um, so we've been anticipating this, and I'm looking forward to the upcoming tour. I mean, and, and it's quite a bit that you guys are going to be doing in our district. So um, I just want to be a part of, you know, making sure we get this information out to the residents of my south district. Thank you. And Council, Council Member Smith? Yes. I'm always just concerned about the traditional lending practices and criteria. So I'm just wondering, um, with a concern around income eligibility and credit score, do these homes, are they sold rather quickly or do they sit on the market waiting for folks? I mean, what's... Ms. Finn, could you come forward and answer those questions, please? <laughs> That's their door. I can only speak to the mm -hmm. homes that we've completed and sold so far through phase one. So. We started construction on the 24 homes in phase one in June of 2022. And um, since then we have completed and sold 15. And the typical time frame from notice to proceed of construction to that closing with the home buyer has been about eight months. And you'll remember we did a lottery for the first phase. So those folks were you know, matched with the houses during the construction process. There was no time sitting waiting for a buyer. Great. So they're going rather quickly. All of yes, them. all of the 24 are matched with buyers. We have four closings between now and the end of May, and then the final five we're leveraging a million dollars of state money to make those happen and hoping to start construction in June. Great, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so seeing no other questions or concerns, I need a motion and a second on introductory number 92. Move it. Moved and seconded on introductory number 92, and now we vote. All in favor of introductory number 92, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say nay. Abstain. And one abstention. Introductory passes. Introductory number 93, we have a disclosure of interest form from President Melendez. He is required to recuse from deliberations and from the vote. Introductory number 93 is authorizing the sale of real estate and grant agreements for the Buy the Block program phase two, going on to the west side. Any council member group? Yeah, can I just ask for a, an overview on any like major changes between phase one and phase two in terms of design of the house, in terms of any any major lessons learned between phase one and phase two? 
Uh, I, will, uh, I will say that uh, we found that the houses in phase one were, were very, very much uh, in demand, that they were designed in a way that made them um, very, very attractive with full basements, with um, all of the appliances, including washers and dryers uh, and dishwashers, um, with mm. uh, traditional styling, uh, many with front porches. Uh, so I think what we're doing is exactly the same thing in phase two, trying to match uh, the style of existing homes, but also making them as uh, user friendly as possible and as desirable for the home buyers. So I don't think there are major um, changes, but I would certainly ask uh, Carol Wheeler, our manager of housing, to add in any comments about that. Well, kind of. Wonderful. Yeah, so there are no, say, major changes, but what we do know as far as this time around is that we will have two um, developers that will be actually constructing the home. So it is the Greater Rochester Housing Partnership as well as Habitat for Humanity. We're still looking at um, <coughs> The similar features, we want to make sure that everything is sustainable. That's something that's very, very important. Something that is slightly different this year or with phase two is that we were able to really put together quite a few of the lots that we could construct on. They were in close proximity to one another. With this particular one, some of them are a little further uh, away, but we try to do as many clusters as possible. This time we are doing 32, up to 32 units as opposed to 24. But what we're looking at is making sure that one, we have a, a great product and that is going to work out well for many of our lower income buyers. Thanks. Just one additional question. And I, I had a chance to tour phase one of the houses are beautiful and I'm not surprised that people love them and I'm happy to hear that they're mostly able to stay the same. I assume price is a factor though. Have we been able to hopefully bring pricing down a little bit as construction has cooled a little bit from when this started? Not quite. Not the other way? <laughs> yeah. It's staying pretty similar to what the construction costs were before. But what we're attempting to do is make sure that individuals are still paying a similar price. And that's one of the reasons that we are, um, you know, seeking additional state funding to make sure that these homes remain affordable. Okay. Thank you. All right. So on that note, we need a motion and a second on introductory number 93. Second. Moved and seconded, and now we vote. All in favor of introductory 93, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Please say aye. aye. And one abstention, introductory passes. Introductory number 94, authorizing the intermunicipal agreement related to lead paint poison prevention inspection services. Questions, comments, or concerns? Seeing none, I need a motion and a second. Move it. Second. Moved and seconded, and now we vote. All in favor of introductory number 94, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Please say nay. Introductory passes. Introductory number 95, appropriating funds and authorizing a loan agreement and payment in lieu of taxes agreement for the Park Square Phase 2 project. Questions, comments, or concerns? Council Member Gruber. Yeah, two questions. First, um, just help me understand, uh, is this exclusively a loan or is, is it a loan of half a million and a grant of half a million? <clears throat> hey, loans? Um, yes, thank you, Council Member, for the question. Uh, this is um, entirely loan funding. Got it. And um, second, in terms of the timeline for this rehab and the relocation process, I know that for um, the other, the tower, the first tower that was done, there was a lot of challenges on the relocation, as I'm sure it, there always is in a project this big. But is there a plan for all of that? Will people have to be relocated? What What is the plan? Yes, there, there is a, uh, a much uh, more specific plan this time. And for people being relocated, um, this building is very similar to the other two in that all of the utilities are in a, uh, a quadrant of the building. So you have to do 
um, all the way from the first floor to the top floor at one time. So folks uh, will be relocated and uh, for the most part will be relocated into um, other units that are available or extended stay um, hotel facilities. And as you know, the extended stay facilities typically have a bedroom, a full kitchen, and uh, so folks will be relocated into those. But uh, we expect the entire project to be completed in 18 months. Um, so some people will be relocated, but not for that entire period of time. Uh, they'll be relocated. They will have the opportunity, if they choose, to go back into the same unit that they came out of, or they can go into a new unit um, at a different location in the building if they want to get back in sooner. So there is a, a very, very extensive plan to ensure that uh, people are, are um, out of their unit for as short a period of time as possible. And, and there's something specific. There's like a written formal relocation plan and that is shared in advance with all of the tenants there? That's correct, yes. Okay. And has that been shared yet? Uh, I'm not sure if the time for that has happened. We do oh. have oh. a Oh, we have a, yeah, I'm we sorry, have go ahead. representative from yeah, jump up. here. And council members, um, as you're looking to formulate your questions, I would t encourage you to take a look at the packet that was handed out for, for, um, for this session. Um, this section starts on page 12 with a fair amount of detail and questions, um, detail and answers for some of the questions that you may have. Sir, please feel free. Please state your name. Michael Burkby with Conifer Realty. Uh, yes, uh, we have begun to provide some general information about the relocation plan to residents. We have a uh, community meeting with the residents scheduled for, that is just getting scheduled for the end of this month, which the full relocation plan will be shared with them at that time. We're also going to continue the communication with residents up to our construction start as well as throughout the construction process. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Any, we'll just come down the line. Um, I just was looking at the transmittal and um, I just got a question and broke down the AMI and it said something about 60% and it also made mention about the 50% area median income. Can you guys just zero in on to, you know, the differences between that and how that relates to this project? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the project we are um, trying to Right now, the project is currently regulated under the old Mitchell-Lama program, which limited all of the apartments to households below 80% of AMI. We are switching the programs from Mitchell-Lama to a, the low-income housing tax credit program. In, in addition to that, we secured 150 project-based vouchers, which previously there was no um, project-based rental assistance available. So those 150 project-based vouchers will be targeted towards households earning less, 50% or less. The remaining 50 that did not get, that we don't have vouchers for, will be at 60% or less. Thank you. Um, that explains it. So um, my other question is, do you have a rough, you said how many was it total for 50%? 150 of the apartments. Does that do, do you have a breakdown of those 150 apartments, or whether they are studio, mm -hmm. um, one bedroom, two bedroom? Yeah, Can you provide overall, that? The, the building is 96 studios, 104 uh, one bedrooms. The exact breakout of which um, income targets will be will be dependent on the existing residents because we don't want to. Okay, it. gotcha. We want to make sure we're accommodating the incomes of the existing residents. Well, thank you. And some of those answers are on page 15 of the handout. We've got some more detail for you. Um, Council President? No questions at this time, thank you. Council Member Smith? How are you? I'm doing well, how are you? Good, so really happy about these renovations. And you guys have more, are offering more, or building more two bedroom units than I've seen a lot of other developers do. So thank you for that. Um, my concern is regarding accountability because over the years I have heard many tenants complain about the management of conifer. And so in terms of accountability, I have a few questions. So first, how are you managing 
tenant complaints? Do you have a documented process? Um, you'll have to forgive me. I'm on. I will do the best I can to answer, but Please. I'm on the development side, so I don't get into the as much on uh, management. But I'm mm, happy to, understood. I'm, I'm happy to follow up with our management team and get you more direct. Answers. I appreciate you. Thank you. Um, but I, I do not know if they are all documented, but we do have on-site man, on management that is there to hear from residents and to respond as best that they can. Um, but I, like I said, I will follow up with our management team and right. get a, a more detailed response. So given he isn't the correct person, Chair, should I put my questions in writing? I would encourage you to do so, yes. All right. Thank you. All right. And on that note, do we need to um, see no other questions or concerns? Need a motion in a second? Move it. Second. Moved and seconded. And now we vote. All in favor of introductory number 95, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say nay. Introductory passes. Thank you. Introduct yes, sir. Thank you. Introductory number 129, it just does my dark heart good to see wonderful things like this. Introductory number 129, authorizing agreements for the Targeted Home Improvement Program. Commissioner Miller, could you tell us about this amazing program that you can't find any information about on the website at all for, mm. the, for the state, but we've obviously gotten funding for? <laughs> I, I can tell you a little bit about this, uh, council, uh, pres uh, council member. Thank you. Um, THIP, or the Targeted Home Improvement Program, is a new program that the state has started. Um, it was an opportunity that was provided to cities uh, throughout New York State and when we found out about it, we uh, applied for it, uh, and we were very fortunate that we were granted $4 million for this program. Uh, so it's a brand new program. It uh, will go for two years with the option to extend for one additional year. And this is designed for low and moderate income homeowners for critical repairs. So that's uh, lead-based paint hazards, health and safety risks, code violations, and roof replacements. Um, as, as you know very well, the things that are more often challenges for uh, owner occupants in our city. So this is a perfect opportunity to take advantage of uh, the need that we have in the city with folks who are living in their homes but unable to afford a new roof or uh, new windows or other kinds of uh, items that need to be fixed. So we're, we're really excited about this. It is a lot of additional work and our team that does rehabs is going to gear up um, with additional staff to uh, make this program work. Okay. Um, Council Member Smith and we'll just run down the line. You good? I'm good. This is amazing. Council President. Yes, thank you. Very excited for this. Um, just a question about the sort of the maximum that can be invested in a property. Is there an upper limit? I know some of the uh, programs we have might have a 25,000 or a 30,000. So th there's numbers that equate to what the maximum is. Does this program have limitations like that? It, it does not currently have any maximum limit. Okay, thank you. And um, in terms of the rollout, once I know that this is all fresh and new and we're, we're probably still figuring those things out, but um, how, how will this be rolled out in terms of um, education to the public? I know that there's a lottery that will be in, a part of this process. Will this just, just go into our standard process that we already have, or will there be something specific for this program? We expect to leverage the existing process that we have, but um, because this is not limited uh, by area, we, we would want to make sure that this is more broadly um, able for folks to know about. Um, we would usually um, take all of the applications through the service centers. We expect to do the same thing with this program. So there would be opportunities throughout the city to apply. And we would um, also want to make sure that people understand the requirements. Um, you know, you have to be up to date on your property taxes. You can't be subject to foreclosure. And you have to be willing to stay in the property for 10 years. So as long as folks uh, understand those things and are at or below 80% of the area-wide median income, we would want to make this as broadly available as possible. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. Very exciting. Well, just just before we go, a little clarification. In the transmittal, 
there is a map and it does show an ineligible area in the city of Rochester, though the vast majority of the city is eligible. Um, Council Vice President. I just want to make a comment. I'm excited about this. I wish we had more funding for this, but um, I'm glad that you guys are going to make do with what we have and uh, looking forward to the outcome. Well, we're, we're certainly hoping that uh, we can demonstrate um, spectacular results with this and that the state will look at opportunities to extend it. So I'm certainly hoping that there will be more money as you've stated. Thank you. Council Member Gruber. All right. And on that, seeing no other questions or concerns, I need a motion and a second. Move it. Second. Moved and seconded. And now we vote. All in favor of introductory number 129, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say nay. Introductory passes. With there being no other work before this committee, we now stand adjourned. Good afternoon. At this time, I will call the People, Parks, and Public Works Committee to order, and I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Vice President Harris. Here. Councilmember Lightfoot. Councilmember Lupian is excused. Councilmember Patterson. Here. Council President Melendez. Here. Thank you. Introductory number 96, authorizing appropriations and agreements and amending the ordinance number 2022-343 relating to the 2024 Millie and Surface Project. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Councilmember Patterson. Thank you. Appreciate you milling my streets. No That's yet. it. Okay. <laughs> I need a motion. In the I second. move it. Need a second? Second. Now, are you all, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Introductory number 97 and bond ordinance of the city of Rochester. New York authorizing the issuance of an 800, 833,000 bond of said city to finance the 2024 milling and surface project. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Move it. Second. Then we vote. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Introductory number 98, a bond ordinance of the city of Rochester, New York, authorizing the issuance of the $79,000 bond of said city to finance water service improvements associated with the 2000. 24 milling and surface project. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Move it. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? And the motion carries. Introductory number 99, a bond ordinance of the City of Rochester, New York, authorizing the issuance of $150,000 bonds of said city to finance improvements to resolve the efforts of the, I'm sorry, <clears throat> to resolve the effects of a water main break at the intersection of St. Paul Street and Bosch Street. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Move it. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Introductory number 100, appropriating funds authorizing agreements and amending the official map for 2024 state touring route milling surface, milling and resurfacing project. A public hearing to he will be held on Thursday, April 18, 2024 at 6 p.m. Any questions or comments 
or concerns? Move it. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And the motion carries. Introductory number 101, authorizing an agreement for Duran Eastman Park site improvements project. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Question yeah. here. Go ahead, President Melendez. Yeah, so very excited about um, about this project. I know that Duran Eastman is, is a significant in importance to the community and it's an important amenity for our community. Um, so, so this specific compensation is, is going to be focused on um, engineering in that area, but will, will residents be impacted by any of the improvements that are being proposed? Can you hear me? Okay, there we go. So this first phase of improvements is primarily related to restoring some areas that have been uh, impacted by uncontrolled stormwater and uh, reducing some impervious, impervious areas to prevent further erosion. Um, we're currently working on a master plan for an overall beach improvements, um, but this first phase uh, will have limited improvements and we plan to start work after the summer season's over. Got it. So then um, in terms of the notification for folks who live around the project, I know that this is a early phase and probably will have minimal impact, but in the bigger scheme of things, has, has there been some um, some more notification and, and engagement around the project in the immediate neighborhood? We had some initial outreach for the master planning process in the Duran Beach House improvement projects. Um, those were kind of put on hold while we advanced the site improvements so we could get these uh, ARPA funds expended in an appropriate time frame. And we'll continue with public improvements once we pick up the master plan and beach house design again. Great, thank you. And I'll move it. You need a second? Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Introductory number 102, authorizing ordinances appro appropriating an annual action plan funds and amending the agreement for Norton Village Playground Project. Any questions, comments, or concerns? M Council Member Gruber. Um, just curious, uh, is there going to be any programming at Norton Village? I mean, there's there, there's there's the kind of makings of a bit more than just a regular playground with the shelter that's there and a couple other things, the baseball diamonds. Wondering if the rec if the rec department has any updates there. Thank you for the question, Council Member Gruber. So right now we have started some programming at Norton Village in January with Rec on the Move. And so we are trying to bring it to life to say. And this summer we are looking to hold our one of our, our summer camps at Norton Village as well. Oh great. This this summer. This coming summer. Oh wonderful. Thank you. I have a comment as well. President Melendez. And then after President Melendez, Governor Patterson. Yeah, so um, thank you for this. I'm, I'm excited about the playground project. I just wanted to also note to the administration that some constituent outreach um, to me to my office uh, came this week around the eclipse, and that the the uh, shelter building um, this appears to be a target for people to stand on top of the building. So I know that this is something I made the mayor aware of, but just for consideration, if there's any potential design or alterations we can do down the road for that building to think about people getting on the roof. Um, I'm not sure how they're getting on the roof, but there's there's uh, challenges with that, and I just wanted to make the administration aware. Thank you. So just a little concern here, um, certainly in favor of the improvements, but I attended the community outreach meeting that was held over the summer regarding this project. And I don't know that a lot of the community concerns are actually reflected here. There was some concern regarding play, playground equipment and some installation of that, but they were they were looking for, they wanted a water feature, they wanted the old ice skating rink in um, return to the area. They wanted a lot a lot of things there. And it's my hope that I could get a report back on what you're including versus what the neighborhood was asking for, because they were also asking for some trees to be trimmed. There were, there were pretty significant asks from the neighborhood, and a lot of the folks that came to that meeting were literally senior citizens who grew up in the neighborhood, and this was their playground back in the day. So they had some definite opinions about what they wanted to see, just from a safety and a, and a review perspective. 
but I can, I, I'm happy to get that in writing. Yeah, I think if you provide us with some of the items that you wanted in writing, we'll respond to those well, specifically specific, and go back well, to what we heard at the meeting. So if you can just go yeah. back specifically to the meeting and, you know, so yeah. the first one is they, they definitely wanted a water apparatus. They, mm -hmm. you know, some manner of, of water engaged, you know, water in the summer, ice in the winter. Um, apparently that space was in the lower part of the ball field back in the day. And they were like, you know, well, why not now? Why let, Let's look into that. Um, the trees along the northern border, they really wanted to know there's a large tree there um, that needs to be trimmed back because the, the kids are playing around in there and, and you kind of lose them in the trees. So they were looking at that. They were happy with the playground equipment and, and the ideas for that. But just if you guys could go back at it and, and give it a look and just give me some feedback on that. I'd like to just see what, what they were asking for versus what we're funding. Sure. We'll, we'll go back and we'll look at anything that can be done from a maintenance perspective within sure. existing resources. We can sure. certainly do probably within, you know, the next few weeks. Okay. Uh, skating enough. and yeah, well, uh, I, features like that probably yeah. are, I can think you can imagine what the response yeah. will be, which is it's a function of cost at this well, point in time. And, or it goes and into we CIP. Can look at it. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I would also say, too, that one of the things that we can make sure of is that the design that we're presenting um, and moving forward with doesn't preclude any of those things okay. in the future. Um, to make sure that we're also now more aware of it and looking for opportunities to fund that as we go forward. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah, absolutely, sir. Need a motion and a second. Move it. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Introductory number 103, amending ordinance number 2023-145 related to Humboldt Recreation Center Water Park. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Oh, but they get a water park. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> I need a motion and a second. Move it. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, motion carries. Introductory number 104, amending ordinance number 2023-2067, I'm sorry, relating to the Rochester Police Department Office of Business Intelligence Renovation Project. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Move it. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Introductory number 105 a local ordinance establishing the operation, installation, and maintenance costs of street lighting special assessment districts for the 2024-25, a public hearing to be held on Thursday, April 18th, 2024 at 6 p.m. Any questions, com comments, or concerns? Move it. Second. All in favor? Aye. The motion carries. Um, introductory number 106, a local improvement ordinance for the care and embellishment of street malls for 2024-25, a public hearing to be held on Thursday, April 18th, 2024 at 6 p.m. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Move it. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. Introductory, introductory number 107, authorizing agreements for transitional job training and placement program. Any questions, comments, or concerns? I believe um, if I'll take the point of privilege I just had. I just wanted to double check the questions I had in the legislative review. I believe my questions were answered. Yes, okay. Uh, I need a motion. Move it. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And the motion carries. Introductory number 108, authorizing an agreement for pro professional corrosion engineering and cathodic protection services. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Move it. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Introductory number 106, authorizing them mandatory professional services for legal services relating to the brownfield properties. Any questions, comments, or concerns? No? Well, I want to say thank you to the administration for providing the list of brown fields. Um, I thought it was quite interesting that all of them was on the west side. Mm. <laughs> Can you provide, I mean, I don't know if you do know, but is there any history behind that and why they were all on the west side? Yes, Vice President, if you look, um, the vacuum oil site is part of Rock the Riverway. So in a lot of cases, we're not looking at them. Uh, from any perspective other than uh, one making sure there's not a contamination issue that would be public health which ideally we've moved way beyond so in most cases what we're looking at are what are the opportunities for redevelopment um, and, and so the two that really stick out there are vacuum oil and the Bulls Head Plaza but of course um, both uh, the former United Cleaners and former Art Co Laundry are both opportunities um, so we work very closely with NBD to say 
where are you expecting that there are some prime redevelopment opportunities? And if but for the environmental issues, can we can we take care of it? So in a lot of cases, that's our whole point here is that this is this is really about that economic and community development. So, um, but yeah, I noticed those too. I was I was expecting somebody else to bring it up. So I'm looking at our. I'm looking at your counterpart from the Northeast to see if he wants that in addition. Maybe we can put a water feature on one over there. Well, you know, all the drains. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate the um, brownfield mitigation on the west side. It's going to definitely help for development and a revitalization of that, those areas. Um, I need a motion in the second. Council Vice President, I have a, a adjacent okay. question. Okay. Um, not specific to this item, but specific to brownfields. I just wanted to ask related to everything that's going to happen around the High Falls State Park sites um, is the city going to be or are we going to be uh, doing some mitigation work ourselves is that the state doing it H how is that going to happen because I know that there's a lot of issues related to the the High Falls area in general um, Council President, that's exactly, we're looking at both ours and theirs and figuring out how that works um, because obviously we don't want the state site uh, for the park to be in isolation. So as you noted, and this is one of these interesting things, right, the river used to be um, this dumping spot and now we've changed it to, no, this is amazing resource, not from the what we used to call an economic development, the big nasties, heavy industrial, um, but actually using it for tourism. So we are having regular discussions. Um, we have a meeting tomorrow. I think it's like a biweekly meeting with the state just to say where are all things. But yes, we are working on those, including 5296 High uh, Fall Street and some other sites that are ours to do. Um, but obviously, we're looking to leverage anything we can with the state to get some of that done, um, irrespective of whether the park would be done or not. So it is foreseeable that we might see an item related to brownfields specific to the city's responsibility down the road. I would say you are correct in saying that it is a likely possibility that you're going to see that in the future. Thank you. I'll move it. All in favor? Oh, I need a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Say nay. And the motion carries. Introductory number 110, authorizing agreements for the Brownfields Environmental Skills Training Program. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Move it. Second. I have, I hold one moment. I just have one quick question regarding this. Can you provide um, an um, RFP summary for this? I mean, you can send it over later, but if you can provide that to us, we'd appreciate it. Yeah, what type of a summary in terms of uh, maybe more or less uh, equivalent of like a syllabus, what, what goes into this particular element of the training that's done or? Well, I think I'm looking at here, you have, who's who's providing the the training? Is it the professional service agreement, who, who you gave the agreement to? Oh, you're looking for RFP summary? Yeah, RFP summary. Hmm. Yeah, I'll let, um, I'll let Ann Spaulding expand on that. Um, but as we develop the best program, I just remind everybody this is sort of the next generation of rejob. Okay. Um, so I, I wasn't sure what you were looking at. And I like apologize. I said, we're like a, no, 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 it's fine. I just wanted to be clear. Were you asking about, you know, how we'll go about selecting the folks for yeah, the training? absolutely. Or the specifics on the training itself for um, Cornerstone. Which how is, you go yeah. about selecting? Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. We can get you an answer. It's going to be very similar. We're going to make sure that we hold... Uh, meeting in each quadrant to introduce this uh, and then go through uh, again the process I'd, I'd love to have that hundred percent placement rate like we do okay. with the job so it gets it gets harder as we keep adding more people with new skills but um, no we can definitely get that to you what our plan is for recruiting uh, potential candidates bless you deputy mayor oh. <laughs> and thank you very much commissioner um, <clears throat> can I get a motion in a second move it second second all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Introductory number 111, authorizing a mandatory agreement for youth growth and development program. Any Question. questions? Councilmember Patterson. Okay, so I apologize. I must have missed it earlier when this, when I'm sure we're doing it again, so I've obviously voted for it in the past. And I just can't place this program to save the life of me. Can you tell me a little bit about it? <clears throat> uh, specifically the best program? No, 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 not best. We're at 111, right? 111. Yeah, 111. 111. Oh, I'm sorry. So for the past two yeah. summers, we have held a youth and uh, growth development program. Okay. With uh, last year, we had about 60 young people and Root, Roots Rochester, uh, realizing others' outstanding talents was one of the vendors in that program last summer. And so we're just extending their contract to continue to use them. 
Okay, so in the past when we funded this, this was part of a large group of funding that we did, and now we're disaggregating them out and giving their own little separate thing. Is that what we're doing? So no, we're just extending it to <coughs> add more funding from the to the contract. Okay. What is the instruction that they are providing? Um, I'm going to ask Isaac, I see him over there, if he can come to the mic and just talk about some of the specifics that Roots have, has provided to our young people. Because it sounds like character-based education and that sounds pretty cool. I just yeah. want to... <laughs> Okay, if you could send over the, the specific curricula regarding a character-based education that they're doing, I'd like to review that. Um, you know, is this Aristilian-based, virtue-based character education, or is this, you know, and, and I'm sure I'll get those answers when you send it over. I don't expect you to give me an answer now. Um, but I would be interested in seeing that. <coughs> okay, thank you. I need a motion and a second. Move it. Move it. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion carries. And introductory number 112, off, 112, authorizing an amendatory agreement for improvements to the International Plaza. I'd like to, uh, I'm going to probably, I'm going to hold this, and then most likely we will bring this forth to next um, council meeting, the full council meeting. But right now I can take questions or comments or concerns. Any questions, comments, or concerns? So we will hold this. Well, just a quick question. So. What are the what are what are the changes that we're making with this seventy five thousand? I'm going to ask Jim Farr to come to the mic. I'm not opposed. I just want to know. <laughs> I can't. Excuse me. Can, is your mic on? Sorry, this is um, okay. Councilmember Patterson. This is an extension of an agreement with uh, for some improvements at the International Plaza of seventy-five thousand dollars. It was various things. What it's being used for is a new shade structure, which should be installed this spring, and we're also adding a full Ansel uh, hood system to one of the containers. Only one of the main containers on Clinton had that capability we have a new vendor that wants to do some different food prep in there and needs that so both of these um, just took longer than we had anticipated to get in place so it's really just extending this agreement um, and l allowing us to use the whole 75,000 sounds good move it uh, we're gonna be holding it too hold? <laughs> I'm excited to know that you'll move it <laughs> okay so um, we will go on to the next one, and that will be introductory number 113, authorizing an agreement for the team building culture and climate consulting services. Any questions, comments, or concern? I need a motion and a second. Move, Move it. it. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Uh, motion carries. Introductory number 114, a bond ordinance of the City of Rochester, New York, um, authorizing the, issu the issuance of 566,000 bonds of said city to finance the Carter Street R Center roof replacement. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Yeah. Councilmember Gruber. Will this have an impact on summer programming? Not at all? No, it will not. Thanks. I need a motion and a second? Move it. All second. In, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And the motion carries. And I have one final question um, that pretty much ends our legislative session there, but I have a final question. Um, thank you to Commissioner Perrin for providing the follow-up question 
for um, the CDL training that I asked questions about. Um, I'd like to ask additional question because I just oh. noticed that I'm not sure if you guys understood. I was looking to see, I know the last time we talked about the CDL um, program, you had mentioned that you had can possible candidates in from the last batch. I don't know if you had a, a some data from that. Um, how many employees did you obtain from that or were they still with us? Can you provide details on that, please? Yeah, absolutely. We can get you the specifics of it. I just want to make sure there's the CDL program that we're working with NISDOT on. With, and that's separate. With, we're working with the New York State Department of Transportation on one. Um, okay. And Council Member Patterson had uh, initiated and made the connection with, and that is separate from the one that we currently use now through BOCES. Okay. Uh, where, uh, but no, we can get you the that uh, for the one for BOCES, that is, uh, I'm going to look to Karen St. Alban just to give me a yes or no on whether or not that is all city employees. No, but in terms of, yeah. Yeah, so, so when we send people, we're only sending our city employees to it, but they're open classes for anybody who would want to participate. Oh, okay. But we can also get you additional information on that as well because that would be an option as the NISDOT program is really a pilot program and I think limited to eight individuals for the first time around. Council Vice President, we have um, introductory 130 and 131 as tweeners that I believe we have to oh. review. So we got to go back. <laughs> okay. So introductory, um, you said we got to go back and do 130? 130 and 131. Yep. Okay. Thank you. So it was missing from my script. I apologize. So introductory number 130, authorizing a grant application for the Flower City AmeriCorps program. Um, any questions, comments, or concerns? Comment. Um, such a positive program in the community and thankful for the administration continuing to, to do this work every year. And I'll move it. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Introductory number 131, authorizing an application and agreement for safe streets and roads for all grant program. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Move it. Need a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. And no one opposed, and that, that um, we're all, I'm sorry, the motion carries. So that concludes the par Parks, People, Works, um, Parks, People, and Public Works Committee. This meeting is adjourned.